Zuba Skerritt, the producer of a series of video programs on postgraduate research, supervision and training. This video series has been produced simply from recordings of a residential staff development program on postgraduate supervision for women held at the Twin Waters Resort on the Sunshine Coast of Queensland in April 1992. The aim of this series is to provide supervisors and postgraduate students with resources to understand and improve postgraduate studies in their department or institution. The reason for non-completion and dropout seems to be more to do with feelings of isolation and a lack of identity or belonging to a community than with anything else. Um, it's not due to a lack of intellectual ability. Um, it's not due to any of the obvious things. And so therefore, I want to talk about some of the responsibilities that are um, due to institutions and also um, overall, I suppose, to government because it's a responsibility of the educational system as a whole to make sure that these um, feelings of isolation are actually recognized and something is done to ameliorate them. Uh, what I'm going to do now is, taking that as a given, talk very quickly about some of the things that can be done at institutional level uh, to support departments, move on to what uh, can be done at departmental level to support supervisors, because so far we've been talking at this very um, individual level of supervisor and student and everything is their responsibility without very much backup. So that, you know, there's this heavy load on the shoulders of the poor supervisor, but in fact the supervisor should uh, be able to have recourse to the department and ultimately to the institution for backup when that's necessary. And I'll give some suggestions as to when that might be necessary. Okay, the first thing is that um, at an institutional level, there should be um, a commitment to develop research students. The institution, the college, the university should really want to do that. And um, that has to be seen to be an aim, not just lip service um, paid to it. Also, um, there has to be something done to ensure that supervisors are really interested in research. We've heard um, earlier in the conference and um, even today of members of staff that don't do any research once they've got their own PhDs, uh, they don't publish. And um, we've also heard that in each department there are some people with lots of students and some people um, who don't seem to have any. So there are different reasons for supervisors taking on research students, which I'm not going to go into now. But it um, is necessary for there to be some kind of monitoring to make sure that those supervisors who have students are doing it for the right and not the wrong reasons, and that they themselves have a genuine interest in research, um, to set an example, and to know what they're doing. Also at the institutional level, and this is, um, uh, at least in Britain it's quite controversial, and only some institutions have introduced it, not all. I don't know the situation here in Australia, you can tell me. Supervision should be um, identified as an important staff role. And by this I mean that it has to be counted into the workload of the supervisor, just as undergraduate teaching or any other part of um, the member of staff's workload is counted, um, work is counted into the workload. And it has to be budgeted for in staff planning, uh, that thing that used to be called manpower planning. <coughs> so that um, when institutions and personnel departments are working out what they'll need in the future and um, what kind of um, assets they've got now, etc., this uh, role of supervision on their academic staff shouldn't be forgotten. And it shouldn't be forgotten in terms of time and of financial support. That's what I mean by budgeting it in and seeing it as an important staff role. Um, certainly an institutional level because um, it comes down for two departments to actually implement that but departments can't do anything unless they have the backing um, and can turn to the institution to do it. Also, um, the institution should insist on a uh, departmental research tutor and 
once again, while it's up to the department to appoint a research tutor and to make sure that it's done in an appropriate way and the role of the tutor is clearly defined, it's um, up to the institution to make sure that they say this is something that's required. Now, am I right in thinking that you're not quite clear on what I mean by a departmental research tutor? Yeah. I am right, okay. Um, this is one member of staff, doesn't have to be a senior member of staff, but one member of staff who has um, responsibility for um, overseeing what's going on with research students, and that includes supervision. So it's very important that the whole department actually agrees, number one, on the person who's going to take the role and that they will support it uh, and support that person. And number two, um, of the um, duties and responsibilities of that person. Because I was research tutor in my department for four years, and during that time there were occasions when I had to go to the head of department, to the professor, and admonish him on what was happening with one of his students. He had several students, but there was one student that um, when, when the reports came in, I'll speak about the reports, uh, it seemed to me that things weren't as they should be. And there was no way that I, as a junior member of staff, could have gone to the head of department um, and said, you know, that you've really got to pull your socks up here, this isn't good enough, etc., etc. <laughs> and we, we switched roles. When I was in my departmental research tutor role and um, he was a supervisor, then we switched roles completely and he was responsible to me. And it could only work if I had the confidence that all the staff was behind me. So you can't give somebody this role and then leave it to them and hope that they'll, they'll do it. You have to have the support. And he would say, Estelle, I knew you were going to come to me, you know, and, <laughs> and, um, and it was okay. So um, that's the overall role. Now, the kinds of things that the research tutor has to do is to see all the um, applications from people that want to do research in the department and be the first person to screen whether or not that seems to be appropriate and then pass them on to a member of staff who might be interested or alternatively pass it around the whole department and everybody marks that they've seen it and um, somebody says whether or not they're interested. But at least the research tutor should know uh, what applications there are and if any of them that come in seem to be totally inappropriate for whatever reason, then it stops at the research tutor who um, gets in touch with the applicant and says, that for these reasons we don't think it's suitable or come back in a year or whatever. And nobody else gets to see it at that point. Then um, when I first created the role in my department, I insisted that I be in on all interviews once we got past the screening process and a member of staff had said that they were willing to supervise this research. We interviewed the applicant and um, the interviewers were the potential supervisor and the research tutor. But I found before very long that I had no time for anything but to sit in on these interviews. And so I changed it to say that there had to be somebody representing the research tutor in these interviews. So there were two members of staff, one was a potential supervisor, and somebody else nominated by the research tutor. Then um, there's monitoring forms that come around. Once again, that's an institutional responsibility to, um, to say that there should be any kind of monitoring of what's going on. But once that happens, then it's up to the department to implement it and the departmental research tutor to see that the forms went round at the right time. We had them um, every six months. Some people have them every term. Some people have them annually. But um, to, first of all, get out the forms uh, uh, because they're not necessarily university <coughs> format, although the university makes sure that, um, that there is this kind of monitoring process. Um, it's up to institutions to decide whether the forms are at university level or at departmental level. And people do it in different ways because sometimes the, um, the students write a report of what they've been doing and then give it to their supervisor who base their comments on the student's work on what the student has written and then it goes to the research tutor before it goes on through the organization. Or it may be that just the, um, the supervisor just writes about the student without the student actually writing anything, but based on what they have agreed between them. So there are lots of different ways, and there are other ways of doing it too. But it was at this point, before I passed the 
monitoring forms on through the organization. That, um, they all came to me as research tutor. Uh, that I, and I went through them all individually to see what the students had said and what the supervisors had said. And it was here that I could pick out. I wasn't, it wasn't part of my job um, as made explicit to uh, be monitoring my colleagues. But in fact, that's how it worked out. And when we discovered that, we had a staff meeting about um, what we should do. And they all said that they thought it was a good idea and, and we should ke keep it that way. But other departments who have, I, there are a, a lot of research tutors around the place now. I think I was the first one because I suggested it um, originally at London University. But um, a lot of people who have research tutors in their department ha ha don't like the idea of being monitored by a colleague. And so they organize this um, annual reporting in such a way that even though they know there is a certain amount of information on the way they're working going to one of their colleagues, it isn't actually um, used. And there may be a private conversation between them, but it isn't used in a formal way in the way I was empowered to use it. I gave you the example with my professor. <coughs> so um, a lot of flexibility built into what's going on, but the role of the research tutor um, is, is a fact, uh, and, and within that fact, you can design it how you want. The, the um, institution should also see there's some kind of in information leaflet or booklet available to new <coughs> students, um, just giving them basic information. And uh, basic information can be anything from how to find their way around the campus and um, the local accommodation, uh, especially if you have students who aren't local students or students from overseas, right through to where to get a thesis bound and, um, and how it should look. There are a whole lot of different th things that need to go into that leaflet. And if you speak to groups of postgraduate students on campus, you very quickly find out what the problems were when they started and the need for an information leaflet or booklet, no matter um, how small or how thin, they really do find that it helps and gradually, once you start with one of these um, bits of information, you can build up from the um, feedback you get what else needs to go into it. Some kind of induction procedures um, so that they can uh, make contact with the people who start at the same time as them across the university. Uh, it's, not, it's not necessarily the people they'll be working with, but just to identify that there are other research students who are at the same um, stage in the process as they are as they go through. And um, one way of doing this is, I'm going to jump because I haven't got this in a very good order, is um, to provide facilities for departments to support a research culture. And by that I mean um, so that the, um, the departments can provide something like a common room or a meeting place for students and that all the students at their induction procedures, um, during their induction program, should know where these are. Um, so that if they want to meet with, stu with research students from another department, they know where the common room would be, that a common room exists, and that they can meet people uh, who, who would be interesting for them to, to speak to. If only to say, I'm feeling really depressed about my work, you know, is it just to do with the stage I'm at, or is it something to do with me? That they've, they've got someone, and they know that they can meet with them. Um, I've jumped here the mechanisms to ensure satisfactory student-supervisor relationship, but it does um, really relate back to um, things like departmental research tutor, um, report forms, some kind of mechanisms that both the students and the supervisors know that the institution is interested in what's going on with them and they're not working in a vacuum. So. Um, well, I think that's enough on the institutional level because it leads on to the departmental level. Given that the um, department has support and facilities and resources provided by the institution, then um, they can get on uh, with things that are required to help supervisors and students in their department without saying, we really need more financial assistance, we really need more space, whatever it is. Um, and one thing that departments can do is provide guidelines for students and supervisors, which make explicit certain things about um, the uh, process involved and the requirements of doing a higher degree. But I think you can go further than that 
and somebody could actually go to the trouble of extracting important points that students should know from the rules and regulations, but also add other things, the kinds of things that we've been talking about here that beginning students don't know about. <coughs> and um, if, it's, if it's agreed um, at institutional level that there should be, for example, annual monitoring, then the student knows that that's going to happen and what his or her role in that monitoring procedure will be. And um, just generally, um, the responsibilities of the supervisor to the student, the responsibilities of the student to the supervisor, at a very general level that um, is accepted across the department, and some of them will be things that are accepted across the institution, but handed to each new um, research student as they, um, as they start in the department. Then I'm a great believer in some kind of contract with the supervisor, and this um, can be a verbal contract. It's totally informal, but it would contain such things as um, an agreement to meetings that are prearranged, not that you diarize a whole year's meetings uh, at the beginning, but that you agree that you will never leave a meeting with the supervisor without knowing when the next meeting will be. And the next meeting sometimes might be a week away, sometimes might be six weeks away, but that you always have in your diary from the time you begin right until the time um, that you get your PhD, uh, an appointment with your supervisor, and the supervisor has the same in um, his or her diary, and that this is sacrosanct so that you don't just um, casually cancel it or turn up late for it. If uh, you have to be on time, I mean, that's just a matter of courtesy, and also it's important because if you arrive late, then you're going to have a shorter meeting. Um, if for any reason you have to postpone it, it's never cancelled, it's always postponed because you phone up, you say, why, and when, this is on both sides, whether you're the staff member or the student, and you um, say why you're not going to be able to make that arranged meeting, and it has to be a very good reason. And at that point on that telephone call, you actually arrange the next meeting so that you never have this hanging around, not quite knowing whether you're going to be able to catch your supervisor and the supervisor wondering whether or not they should chase up the student or leave them for a bit longer. So that would form part of the contract and other things that the two of you on your own think are important for your relationship to develop satisfactorily. It may be part of the contract to agree that you're going to talk at a meta level every now and then about how the relationship is going, or to include process in your discussion, not just topic and how, um, how the work is going. So there are a lot of things that, that can be done, but um, that's on a one-to-one -one basis, and um, one supervisor with several students might have different kinds of things in the contract with each of those students. Um, the, departmental, uh, the department has responsibility to, to provide resource backup and this is, of course, assuming that it has institutional um, support. And the resource backup I've already spoken about would be things like providing um, a common room, desk space, um, somewhere where um, research students know that they can leave their, their bags and their coats while they go to the library, um, and to make sure if, if technicians are needed that technicians will, will help them, just to make sure that um, there is support around the department and that um, other members of staff in the department are aware that the students are there and might need their help from time to time. It's also very important that the department insist on an adequate research proposal um, because this is a place where people can fall down. And I don't know whether you have different, um, uh, different procedures in different institutions here or whether it's uniform across the board. But it sometimes, um, from my experience, students aren't admitted unless they have a research proposal that's um, been approved by the person who's going to supervise them or by uh, people who form a committee in the department or the university. And sometimes, having been admitted on their potential, they are given time to write a research proposal. Now, I'm not quite sure whether you vary or whether you have something that happens um, pretty uniformly. But one way or another, this is a very important thing because if the student can't, um, at quite an early stage, get out a research proposal that shows that they know what they're doing, just as we spoke about the grant application yesterday, there are certain things 
that are taken for granted. You have to know what you're doing. You have to know what the methodology is. You have to know you can gain entry to an organization if that's necessary. Um, if you fall down at that point, then um, there's no reason why you should be able to satisfactorily go through the rest of the hoops. So that's something that a department has to really mark, and that would be something that the research tutor would want to keep an eye on. Uh, monitoring progress, I've spoken about um, the, the forms. And finally, that there are group meetings, so that <coughs> there's this um, feeling of belonging, a feeling of community, of identity, uh, anything to get away with from the feelings of isolation. When I was a part-time PhD student, I did most of my work, um, except for what I did in the library, at home on the dining room table alone. And um, for a period of several days, I remember having a meaningful relationship with a grasshopper. Um, this uh, grasshopper had, in fact, uh, perched on a pot plant in the back garden and didn't move for several days. And um, so I kept coming out, you know, after working at my desk of pain <laughs> for some time. I would go out just to see what was happening. Usually it was nothing. And I, I noticed that the grasshopper had no wings. And uh, since my thesis was feeling pretty much like a flightless insect at this time, uh, I had felt a certain sense of identity shared with uh, the, the insect. Um, as time went on, um, bubbles began to exude from the posterior of the grasshopper. And um, I thought, my God, she's pregnant, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but in fact, um, she was beginning to molt and had quite a nice pair of wings underneath. I took heart. And my thesis eventually did fly. Um, but um, um, for some time, this was really the only living creature <laughs> with whom uh, I had any form of contact, however limited. Um, you may uh, wonder what can be inferred from this, uh, aside from the fact that my PhD was not in entomology. <laughs> but um, it was simply that my intellectual and social isolation was so intense that uh, really interspecies communication was, uh, was quite satisfying. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think my kind of isolation is not necessarily the isolation that many other women feel. Uh, often it's the case that although uh, women are intellectually isolation, they're in a social maelstrom with uh, uh, partner, children, cat, bird, dog, all making demands so that a room of one's own is what is really needed. Although it should be said that that room of one's own it is, not, is peace rather than isolation. Um, and that um, I've known a number of women who, who left the isolation of suburbia to enter the university and found it terribly exciting and stimulating but when they took up um, postgraduate work, they found themselves in an intellectual suburbia. Um, intellectual isolation uh, is not just a, um, a personal experience, but it is, in fact, something that has been pointed out um, by a number of observers and, and students of the postgraduate research scene. Uh, Jennifer Welsh, back in 1979, was making the recommendation on the basis of her uh, interviews with students that it's the responsibility of departments to really integrate students into the life of the department. And uh, that student and staff member alike uh, were saying that the social and intellectual isolation needed to be alleviated. Uh, Ten years later, 1989, Margaret Powell's um, gave intellectual isolation as the most frequently given reason for, that is a university-related reason, that doesn't count financial factors for withdrawal from postgraduate study at the University of Melbourne. Uh, Jan Whittle, who is here today, has um, mentioned in her work, looking at research cultures, um, how much social is isolation can be a problem and how important it is that peer interaction be used as a way of overcoming this. Estelle Phillips, too, has um, in her How to Get a PhD, which is a really useful book for both uh, students and postgraduate, uh, both students and uh, supervisors, has pointed out that uh, isolation, which is often associated with the humanities and the social sciences, because science people work in teams, uh, is actually a problem for scientists as well, that they're frequently working on their own little part of a team project and still have limited opportunity to discuss and to find out uh, where each is in the process. 
Um, another um, effect of intellectual isolation is that um, it becomes difficult for people to really understand what the research process is. We were talking earlier in the, the writing sessions on the difference between uh, looking at the product and imagining yourself achieving that product in the end and looking at the process of writing. And it's very true with postgraduate research as well that um, when we see the final product, an article that looks beautiful in a journal uh, or a thesis that's complete, it's really intimidating uh, because we don't understand uh, all that's gone into it, the agony as well as the ecstasy. And Barger and Duncan in an article on creativity in uh, doctoral research have said that um, uh, this standardized reporting that we have uh, showing the final product conceals all of the stumbling that goes on. Uh, it was really useful, I thought, when Royce was uh, speaking earlier, uh, that he was talking about uh, what examiners had said to him. Uh, supervisors often don't give information about what they go through. And uh, in group settings, it's quite possible to do what he did, which, which was to say, uh, yes, somebody said, gee, you know, uh, you haven't even considered a really important source. And it's useful for students to see that supervisors uh, can also miss things. Um, so part of the importance of um, trying to uh, find ways of using groups is to ensure that, um, that this is understood. Uh, Flannery O'Connor, who was um, a writer in the 50s and the 60s, wrote uh, A Good Man is Hard to Find a number of other stories, um, had um, raised peacocks as an avocation. And she observed that um, peacocks, of course, made fantastic displays. Um, and a kind of visual tremolo showing their um, uh, shimmering blue-green uh, bronze uh, tails. But then she said uh, the, the peacock would often turn its back to its audience and show its brown, dusty-looking tail feathers. And um, sh her observation was that um, although people sometimes considered the peacock to be contemptuous of its audience, she felt that it was just as well pleased with its backside as with its front side. And I think we need to recognize the importance of that backside of ourselves, the, the difficulties we go through, uh, because we can learn from them. And you get much more breadth if you're looking at other people's problems in research and are learning about what they are going through. One of the things that um, I've been working on is looking at case studies of supervisory groups. But ordinarily, just looking briefly at the models that we um, um, have, the single supervisor model is, is by far the most common. And this means it is really the dyad of student and supervisor. Um, the joint supervision um, is becoming uh, much more common. Even here, however, it's a kind of variation of the single supervisor model. But the joint supervisor provides another um, a source of information for students. The supervisory committee has also been uh, suggested, and several people were referring to the North American system here. Um, my experience of supervisory committees is that um, they're often not very effective, that the supervisor is really the only point of contact. The committee does have some um, uh, opportunities to assist at certain critical points in the process, that is, in looking at the research proposal, so there is more uh, input at that stage. There may be other stages um, uh, at which the committee will be involved. But it sometimes also can mean that the student is one single individual against a group of supervisors. And that is quite an intimidating situation. Uh, it also can mean sometimes there will be debates between supervisors um, or the main supervisor and the supervisory committee that will leave the student out. Uh, so there are some uh, problems with that approach. Still another. Um, uh, kind of model is candidate involvement and supervision. And this is what I'm most interested in. And some of you have experienced this already yesterday in the, um, the um, uh, humanities uh, research design workshop in which uh, a couple of um, uh, students attended each group and actually um, answered questions about what is the, the research about? What is the design? Um, the sorts of groups that I've been seeing can vary in quite a number of ways. And I'm, I'm indicating the, the variables here just to give a notion of uh, the various possibilities. Um, the, um, uh, the groups that I've seen 
have started in a number of ways, either initiated by faculty, and in fact, some that we've looked at closely have been started by faculty, but some have been started by students as well. Um, their structure can be either formal or informal. Um, they may be task-driven or psychologically driven, just so that people have the opportunity to be with each other and to share <coughs> their um, unhappy moments. Uh, the timing can be uh, regular or irregular, frequent, infrequent. Uh, membership also has um, many variables. Uh, it can be large, small, diverse, homogeneous, mixed sex, single sex. Usually this is related to the field, however, rather than a deliberate intention of uh, separating the sexes. Consistent or fluid, um, and uh, that means often the uh, a certain cohort of students, and Estelle can talk to you about the cohort a little later, um, may work together in a very structured sort of way. Or there may be people from various um, uh, levels, honors, PhD, masters, working in the supervisory group. And in that case, it's often fluid. The honors people leave after a year or so, um, and the others stay on. Um, the supervision can involve one faculty supervisor or several. Um, it may mean that there's um, uh, a single discipline involved. There can be people from many disciplines. Uh, all of these, the relationship of the, re the research of the students uh, to each other's work may vary as well, so that they can be very closely related, not so closely related at all. And one of the important observations in looking at the various kinds of groups is that despite the differences, it seems that just groups are perceived as being quite wonderful. Um, those who were in, um, uh, of, of those that I've observed anyway, um, those who were in groups where uh, the students were working in a pattern of, uh, as a cohort, working uh, first through the research design, then through uh, the, um, uh, the next stage until they were dealing with the analysis and finally the the write-up, um, those people felt that synchronization was absolutely crucial, that it was important that they be together as they do those tasks. On the other hand, uh, in a group which was quite different, um, which had uh, honors, PhD, uh, master's people doing work that was in the same sub-discipline area, but on very different topics, these people said the diversity was what was exciting. And again, referring to the um, meeting that we had um, uh, among humanities people who were uh, having those group meetings with, su with supervisors and students. Uh, I, I remember a number of comments uh, about how useful it was to have people who were quite out of the field um, of study to give a completely different perspective. There was, in fact, a conference group which involved 40 students and 10 supervisors in marketing. And uh, they met, they had a national meeting um, at which time the uh, students gave presentations on um, their projects to each other. Uh, there were a number of supervisors who were giving hot topics in, in marketing, things that people might be interested in following through on, uh, who were also describing their own research and problems that they were facing in that. Uh, because there are very few students in some fields, even Australia-wide, uh, it can be useful to take this sort of approach as well, even though the meeting is very the meetings are very infrequent, there, there's value in that kind of approach as well. And because it is a conference for postgraduate, it isn't as intense or uh, as intimidating as, as perhaps normal conferences would be. Uh, one group that I thought I would give just a bit more information on was a directed team. And um, this was an attempt by a supervisor at Griffith to um, adapt a science model of supervision, or what he perceived to be a science model, and that is to um, have uh, students working together on a project that was uh, very much in his own current area of research. Um, the students were masters um, of administration students. Uh, they had already had two years of coursework, and the, um, the second year had involved a reading seminar, at which time they were working together in doing literature reviews in, um, in areas where they were working together as a group. He basically said, uh, I'm only really going to supervise in this area of research using this theoretical framework. Anyone who wants to work with me um, will need to choose this topic. Um, 
he was quite worried that maybe the students would feel very constrained. As a matter of fact, apparently they didn't, because often they were looking at the context in which they wanted to work, accounting, performing arts, and were searching for a theoretical framework. So that worked out um, uh, well. The roles of the students in this group were several. Um, each was a team member and an apprentice to the supervisor. And these were the two aspects of the group that were uh, supposed to um, be uh, emulating the science approach. But at the same time, the, um, each student was an author writing continually. I'm avoiding writing up, Peggy, wherever you are, um, from the very beginning of the process so that there were always uh, pieces of writing being handed into the supervisor and shared with other students. Each was also a speaker. At almost every meeting, each person uh, gave a presentation on um, uh, just what the progress had been since last time. And Margaret Powell's, again, in the study that she did, was saying how important it seemed to be to students who had given oral presentations. Um, and she was encouraging that be done. And probably in uh, this kind of environment, it's a much safer environment than in um, some, say, postgraduate study seminars. Um, each member of the group also was a supervisor, and they did, in fact, reinforce each other, criticize, um, uh, question, discuss their work, and friend. And that really is not to be um, underestimated. Uh, there was another group at the University of Queensland. Um, my husband teaches in the Department of Studies and Religion there, so he uh, pointed out to me that one of the supervisors there um, uh, had developed a group of students uh, whom he was supervising they were um, honors postgraduate, uh, honors master's PhDs. Um, they met about once a month um, also, gave oral presentations, though not so often, perhaps only once a year or a little more often, uh, because it was a, a larger group of about eight to 10, quite fluid again. Um, the supervisor also treated the members of the group to lunch in the staff club. <laughs> each time. <laughs> and this went over very big, actually, although it's not something that can be implemented uh, easily unless the department usually provides resources. He provided his own. But um, that social interaction, that more informal interaction, was also very important to people. And um, uh, the, um, the groups were quite different. The group that was at Griffith, which was much more structured and uh, with synchronization being important, um, but both of them were perceived by students to be extremely useful and um, helpful both personally as well as in providing the sorts of um, um, uh, assistance that supervisors normally provide on research design, methodology, and so on. At this stage, small groups were formed to discuss possible changes to counteract intellectual and social isolation of postgraduate students. Group representatives then reported the results to the conference. We want to encourage students in the best way to come and do research with us. We should be sure about the topics which we are able to present for them and supervise well which means that, for example, uh, we raised the idea that we could uh, produce a book booklet for each of the departments where we define that so-and-so group does this and that research and the area of interest of this group is this and that and please do come and join us. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean that other topics uh, are not possible to be uh, topics of PhD students, but however, we felt more comfortable with the idea of supervising people in the areas of interest of the departments. We talked quite a lot about the idea of getting groups together for seminars and workshops, etc., um, work in progress kind of meetings. There were a lot of issues in how those could be most successfully structured. Um, perhaps they should have some goals. Perhaps they need a fairly sophisticated level of facilitation. The bottom line seemed to be that people won't come unless they feel there's something they're going to get out of it personally. And so that really does need to be attended to. You need to tune in fairly carefully to the group and its needs. 
The other thing that I thought was um, very interesting, and this has already been tried out um, by one individual, and this is pre-conference student poster presentations. And this is something that could take place once a year, and a supervisor or a group of supervisors who are particularly interested in, in um, the welfare of their students, postgraduate students, could possibly convince the conference organisers to include something like this a day before the official conference is to begin. And the students would then be able to uh, present information about their research in, in this um, sort of through a poster presentation and this possibly would um, give students the opportunity to know what is happening um, in the field. So have a policy document which says a PhD student shall um, have funding to go to two conferences during the time of their um, candidature. Uh, one at the beginning where they don't need to present a paper and to, to uh, network with various people and another one toward the end where they should be presenting a uh, paper. So we do encourage postgraduates at the University of Queensland, at least in, in the Graduate School of Management. Maybe more cooperation or, and or communication between staff members, perhaps one supervisor. Uh, may have is using a method that's working brilliantly well in helping their student and perhaps that needs to be communicated to other staff members within the department. Um, also, the, I suppose the major things, if you want to help postgraduates, you really should ask them, well, what do you want? You know, what are your needs? What are your problems? Have some sort of a consultation perhaps at the start and say, what can we do for you? What can we do to make your life as a postgraduate student easier? Uh, what to do about the whole problem, what to do what in the way of solutions. Well, um, one of our groups said, well, just individually clean up our own act, do our best, act as examples to other staff members, try to do what we can to make, as, make it as easy as possible for those, you know, who are our students, the people we're supervising. Again, in, in uh, probably another communication situation, vocalise your own goals, what you're doing, what your aims are, sort of uh, provide perhaps a bit of inspiration for other people, ideas that the staff members might be able to pick up on and use. Um, and also everybody, just on the wider scale, everybody at this conference, go back, go back to your department, and that includes staff and postgraduates, and, and tell them just what did go on here and what sort of ideas were flying around here and perhaps see if they can be used within, the, within your own departments.